Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with another feature history video. This time, something um, that when I took an Irish history course this past semester, I was absolutely confused by. Like, I'll say, uh, we, for the last, like, I think we spent, I want to say at least one month, where we just, it was just on the troubles. Like, we were, the last month of class was just on the troubles. And so if you know, and it was a 300 level class, it was not a 400 level you know, so for you people that have gone through university and stuff, specifically, you know, history, uh, you've got, if you've worked on any history courses, uh, you know how fast you have to go through information in those classes and just how much information is there. I couldn't wrap my head around the troubles. I was really confused. Like, I think we talked about the Ulster, Ri Ulster Rising. Was it Dublin? Ri I, I, I think I wrote my final paper in that class on the Dublin Rising. I think that's what Easter Rising. I see. I'm just <laughs> I'm easily confused on I, when it comes to Ireland. So uh, hopefully this video can actually help me make uh, some sense of the troubles. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Oh, diddly dee! A oh, leprechaun put a bum in me potato. Ah. I gotta watch that again. Oh, diddly dee, a leprechaun put a bum in me potato. Ah. <laughs> oh my god, why is that? Why did that break me so much? <laughs> oh, diddly dee, a leprechaun put a bum in me potato. Now, with all the <laughs> Irish people having been disgusted and left, we can start. Oh, yeah, Irish people are gonna be pissed at that. <laughs> oh. But actually, that bomb should be put in a uh, car. Anyway, ew. and that probably just pissed off maybe some Englishman with that. Hello and welcome to Feature History, featuring the impatiently awaited and source of much pester, the Troubles, a rather understated name for a 30-year-long period of sectarian violence at its finest. It formed both the issues and the culture of our contemporary Northern Ireland, and is such a relevant topic today, you can expect many, many on- The St. Patrick's Saltire isn't the official flag in North Ireland. Here you are bad and should die. My dad is Irish, therefore you are bad. You're not wrong because I said- it. opinions in the comments. Enough about that though, we have two videos worth of controversy to get through here, and now. And later when the second part goes up. <laughs> For the source of the troubles, you can go all the way back to 1169, with the Norman conquest of Ireland. Yeah, the Normans fucking ruined Britain. I'm saying it. Normans ruined everything. Fuck the Normans. But for the sake of brevity, I'm going to try to rush to the 20th century. Irish leaders for many centuries would struggle politically with English kings, and this yes. peaked with the Protestant Reformation that saw the majority oh, of yeah. England turn Protestant with their monarchy, and the majority of Ireland remain Catholic. A rebellion in the late 16th century saw new efforts to assimilate the Irish by just replacing who the Irish were. Protestant yep. English and all right, so one of the things that I think um, is actually when it is actually really rather unique when it comes to the conquest of Ireland in regards to European conquest of other Europeans, uh, you know, w when it comes to the English treatment of the Irish for a lot of the history and the way they treated Catholic Irish, um, a lot of people argue that this was really kind of what you would see how Europeans would treat colonial nations, right? Um, like, the way the English treated the Irish is kind of, you know, people draw comparisons to how the English treat, you know, the, the Indians of the British Raj, of, you know, uh, of, you know just Asians, um, you know, South Africa, that kind, that kind of stuff. A lot of people, it, you could make an, a good argument that Ireland was treated as more of a colonial conquest instead of just a typical European conquest of land, right? You know, like the French, um, or like, uh, you know, Austrian conquests, uh, like the Ottomans conquering Greece or whatever. Now, of course, there will be some small, because of culture, there will be conflict there, right? There always will be conflict there. 
but really, you know, it wasn't seen as something really, I guess, out of the norm for how, I guess, Europeans, which, even though Turks aren't European, Ottomans weren't European, but you, you know what I mean, right? Um, that kind of thing. Whereas, but then the way the English would treat the Irish, kind of, was kind of different for how Europeans treat fellow Europeans. And the Scottish were sent to Ireland to attempt to colonize the island and saw success in the north, or as it is otherwise known by, Ulster. The following yep. English Civil War and Glorious Revolution would see the Irish Catholics ally with the losing side, leading to <laughs> penal laws being placed on them by the yeah. Protestant English Parliament. During the Great French Wars, the French would provoke a Protestant-led rebellion for Irish independence, which caused the British government to claim Ireland as a core part of their kingdom and bring them under further control. Concessions would be made with the Catholic emancipation in 1829, but it did little to improve their position. The damage had been done and many Catholics were still made to live on the poorer land. A turning point would be the decimation caused by the Irish Potato Famine in 1845. One wow, we jumped really far. Million deaths exacerbated by British mismanagement. And for those that don't, I don't know if he's going to mention it, he probably will, I don't know. Um, Ireland, uh, the total population of Ireland still has not recovered from the Potato Famine. And caused the Irish to demand for an Irish Parliament. Some demanded for full Irish independence, but the most popular movement was that of Home Rule. It'd see a self-governed yes. Ireland within the United Kingdom. Its bill would finally be passed in 1912, much to the scrutiny of the mostly Protestant Ulster loyalists in the North. It'd however be placed on hold given the outbreak of the First World War. Some more radical and then Irishmen the would come out against British rule in 1916 dubbed the Easter Rising. It had failed, but when the insurrectionists were executed by the government, the rebels would become martyrs. Their fringe movement yes. turned into public outrage. 73 members of the Irish Republican Party, Sinn Féin, would be elected to the British Parliament in 1918, and would refuse to attend the Parliament in London, instead choosing to form an Irish Parliament in Dublin in 1919. This action would spark the War of the Independence that saw the Irish Republican Army brought together to fight for well, an Irish Republic. <laughs> the Anglo-Irish Treaty drawn up in 1921 would see a partitioned Ireland, one to be split between the mostly Catholic Nationalist South and the mostly Protestant Loyalist North. However, there was a catch, as there was a significant Catholic minority present in Northern Ireland. There was also a substantial amount of people generally not pleased with the treaty, refusing to recognise the compromised Irish Free State and certainly refusing to recognise a British Northern Ireland. The stem of the IRA would break off as the anti-treaty IRA and fight in the Civil War. Only yeah, see, this is, this is where I started getting confused, when the IRA started splitting and all... All these factions started propping up inside of Down Ireland. in 1923 Ugh. and have the Free State be affirmed. These wars had caused a drift in Northern Ireland. The Protestant majority now suspected and occasionally feared the Catholic minority, who had grown to see the Protestants as oppressive and tyrannical. Over the course of several decades, segregation became normalised between the two communities. In hiring, education and housing, Protestants and Catholics rarely mixed. The anti-treaty IRA still existed, however dormant. It had begun to see an influx of Marxists, much to the annoyance of the older, more traditional members. In the early 60s, Northern Ireland became subject to a civil rights movement, set on highlighting the inequalities in the province. Staunch loyalists feared it as an IRA front, a facade made to lead to a united Ireland. Civil rights protests began to lead to riots, as both partisan loyalists and the Royal Ulster Constabulary wished to crack down upon them. This led to a great number of Catholics rejecting the IUC's authority, attempting to create their own institutions, as seen in the self-declared autonomous area of Free Dairy. Tensions had been rising steadily since 1966, and would climax in 69. A Protestant <laughs> parade was set to move through a Catholic oh. area of London Dairy, or Dairy, or whatever you want to call it so you don't get mad. Protestants and Catholics would initially begin slinging any old crap at each other, leading to clashes. As the police moved in to crack down, battles erupted. This is known as the Battle of the Bogside. Hundreds of police and civilians were injured in the riots, and the officers of the constabulary would be pushed from the Bogside area. By the third day of rioting, things had become intense, and the Northern Irish Prime Minister requested British troops to relieve the officers. A battalion would intervene as a neutral force to separate the residents from the police and bring an end to the battle. With the news of the battle spreading quickly, agitated Irish nationalists began to break out in protest, and the Ulster loyalists, fearing a total uprising, began to clash with nationalists, causing widespread violence across Northern Ireland. 
With an overwhelmed and accusedly biased constabulary not of much help, the British Army would have some serious trouble maintaining yeah. law and order. The Honeymoon! Oh the boy. Army had initially been welcomed as a neutral force into the Troubles. The Nationalists and Loyalists both believed the Army was there to protect them from the other. As the violence continued, however, some Nationalists began to believe too little was being done to quell the violence against them. The divide in the population was clear, but beneath the surface another divide had formed. In the IRA, the traditionalist Republicans broke away from the Marxist bunch due to the perceived unwillingness of their leaders to protect nationalist communities. This new provisional IRA would soon dwarf its paternal organisation. They had though inherited a crumbling support. Few wanted the help of a paramilitary gang. This changed when in the Battle of St Matthews in 1970, the local IRA beat back an armed loyalist mob in a shootout, serving huh. to guard a Catholic nationalist enclave. It was a significant propaganda victory for the organisation. The British Army looked to disarm this violence. It would enter the infamous Foles Road area of Belfast, a nationalist stronghold, to seize arm dumps. They were thorough and harsh in their action, doing a significant disservice to their reputation. In the Foles Curfew, the army would come under harassment from both the IRA and angered residents, leading to the unfortunate death of four civilians. In August of 1971, the British Army and RUC would undertake Operation Demetrius, which sought to unturn paramilitary members. However, their list held a strong nationalist bias, and the operation itself was subject to fumbles, leading to an upsurge in reactionary violence. Those interned reported torture. Two IRA members were killed, two soldiers had also been killed, not to mention 20 civilians. It wasn't a good look, to say the least. With nationalist support of the army at an all-time low, in the hopes of defeating the IRA militarily dashed, the soldiers would be turned to local policing, checkpoint duty, and riot control. The unpopular policy of internment continued as well. Imprisonment without trial. I'm, I'm trying to keep my head wrapped around all this, but it's hard. Seen as the only <laughs> logistical way to deal with the unrest. It it's coming in, in so January fast. In January of 1972, both the army and the police were deployed to oversee an anti-internment march in Derry. British paratroopers were okay. present, and they had been despised for their role in killing 11 people during Operation Demetrius. Small groups began to lob rocks at the paratroopers, provoking the paratroopers to open fire in return. The really, paratroopers rocks? I mean, yeah, rocks can hurt, but you have guns! The crowd would quickly devolve into chaos. 28 people would be shot and 14 died. Don't, don't, you did not understand how quickly shit can go wrong when, you know... This is exactly what happened with the Americans and the British in, um, there's that famous painting where they're throwing, like, snowballs at the British, uh, troops, and then no one knows who shot first, and boom, shit went into chaos. Given the circumstances like the, of their deaths, it feels a very similar situation here. Actions, and the British army at large felt the ire of the nationalists, Catholics, and more. In what would become known as Bloody Sunday, it would oh, put yeah. a definite end to any idea of a honeymoon. Is that where we're ending with Bloody Sunday? It looks like Yes, it. I know this part was short, but tough tits. You'll get another one eventually, so don't suck. Alright, uh, yeah, I will have to watch part two, because I'm guessing he's going to talk a bit more on Bloody Sunday. Um, anyways, that was Feature History, The Troubles of Ireland. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.